Okay, folks, we're recording now. So welcome to our September webinar. Um, my name is Lillian Hogendorn. I'm the Acting Manager of Digital Access and Open Educational Resources at eCampus Ontario. And it is my joy and pleasure to host webinars every single month. Um, without further ado, I just want to introduce our speakers today. Um, we're joined by the team at the OER Lab at Ontario Tech University. Um, so we've got Sarah Stokes here. Um, who is the staff person managing that, that lab. And then um, we're joined by uh, Pranjal, who is a student uh, who runs this lab. Uh, Rebecca was unable to be here today and Eamon will join us at 12.30 because school is back in session and um, students have places uh, to be. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to these uh, wonderful folks who are gonna tell you about the OER Lab at Ontario Tech, what they're up to, and how, um, how they're supporting open education. All right, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's afternoon where we are here in uh, Ontario, but I noticed that we have some folks from, from out west and maybe there's some folks elsewhere. Um, so I wanna first thank eCampus Ontario and the Ontario Open Library Network for inviting us uh, to talk to you today about the OER Lab. Um, it's something that I've been really privileged uh, to participate in this summer. It was our first um, instance of the lab as a way to um, increase sustainability of OER on our campus uh, at Ontario Tech University, but also as a way to engage students in the um, education process and the development process as well. So, um, if you have questions, please feel free to break in. I'll do my best to sort of keep an eye on the chat or maybe Lillian can let me know if I've missed anything uh, in particular. We are uh, really lucky to have two of our students um, on the staff joining us today, uh, Prenjal and Eamon. Eamon, as Lillian, Lillian mentioned, is in class until 1230, so you'll hear the students speak towards the end of uh, my talk. And then really, um, if you have questions or you want to have a discussion, uh, that's really going to be the, the biggest benefit of sharing for, for all of us here today. So, um, really what is Ontario Tech University? For those of you who don't know, it is uh, sort of the former um, UOIT or on University of Ontario Institute of Technology. We had sort of a rebrand and rebirth um, this time, actually May of last year, so 2019, when we're really looking to find our uniqueness in, in the world of post-secondary education. And um, one of the ways that we're doing so is by really promoting tech with a conscience. So looking to not only be leaders in technology um, and in novel technology, but looking to, to do so with the aim to improve the lives of the people on the earth, the planet itself, um, and looking to do so through the ethical application of technology. Um, we are really striving to promote this in our teaching and our learning practices, um, in administration on campus and through our research as well. And it's really for us um, about not only developing the next tech breakthrough, but understanding and integrating technology and the ethical implications of that technology. And that's how it, uh, we're going to differentiate ourselves. So um, one of the ways we're doing so is really by taking a look at open educational resources and how they can be leveraged uh, to the greater benefit of our students and our faculty. And just a few stats about OER. Um, at Ontario Tech, so since 2018, that's when we sort of officially started our OER work. Um, we at this point don't have official tracking, it's sort of manually done, but we have 30 courses that have adopted OER since 2018, with the bulk being in 2019. Um, some of those include some of our really large courses like Physics 1 and Calculus 1, so those are our two largest courses in the university, um, and we were able to convert those to OER in 2019. We have 19 faculty members using um, OER or affordable course content. 
And since 20, uh, 2018, we've saved nearly $1 million in uh, student fees by converting courses to OER. So something that we're super proud of, um, Lillian's probably going to send me a message saying you haven't uh, submitted your adoptions for 2020 and we really just did the calculation last week so we can have those sent into the network um, as soon as we can. And Okay, yes, she's absolutely going to send that message to me. So, um, but one of the ways that we've managed to do this is by looking at some of those, those pressing questions that I'm sure many of you have heard about OER on campus. So these are sort of the, the obstacles that were so clearly articulated by uh, James Skidmore um, in his policy piece um, in 2019, and I've linked it uh, there at the bottom of the slide for those of you who haven't read it. Um, and it's really sort of five key obstacles to OER adoption from a faculty point of view. So that's really where things sort of jumped off um, with the OER lab. So looking at the lack of professional recognition, um, many tenure and promotion, thank you, Lena, for providing that report. Um, many tenure and promotion committees do not consider um, the authoring of OER as a portion of their um, adjudication. The lack of resources, and this is, you know, it's bolded because this is the case for anyone who works in post-secondary, uh, probably across Canada. The lack of time or the lack of um, financial resources or human resources that are required to put together um, a feasible OER. Lack of clarity for IP rights. Um, lack of quality or perceptions of lack of quality. So this is another sort of important issue that we flagged here at Ontario Tech and the lack of a co uh, cohesive campus approach. So I want to sort of preface the discussion a little bit by saying that I worked at a uh, traditional publishers, that's where I got my career started, um, for nearly six years as an editor and a project manager. So Part of the, the reason that the OER lab happened is because I understood the workings of an editorial team and how we go from idea to manuscript to finished project and, um, and to a physical book or an ebook in many cases. Um, and it's really about sort of the things that I've highlighted in bold here or the lack of resources, that quality approach. And in essence, a, a cohesive I put campus approach because that's what um, James Skidmore has indicated, but it's really sort of looking at the team approach. So it's not just a faculty member sitting and, and doing it off the side of his or her desk um, to try and create this OER for their classes, because that is a huge, huge undertaking. And in the publishing world, you would typically have um, a staff of probably dozens working on any given resource. So you'd have a project manager to oversee timelines, you'd have um, editorial staff who are responsible for individual chapters, you'd have a copy editor um, who is responsible for, you know, grammar and spelling and consistency, uh, you'd have graphic designers, you typically in, in heavy STEM disciplines have a subject matter expert in-house in addition to the author who is um, a group of people or an individual who have their sort of their voice to lend to the book. Um, and then you'd have marketing and layout and typeset and I mean the list goes on and on. And so expecting a, an individual professor to be able to put that out on their own is really not feasible um, given the best of times and, and I'll talk a little bit about sort of how we had to pivot a little bit for, for the realities of 2020 for our lab approach. But these kind of ideas is really what brought um, the OER lab into existence. And I was actually on my way to the test conference in 2018 when I was talking to a colleague who is, is a professor and we came up with the, um, we were talking about the the abilities of a traditional publisher to put out a book and then I thought how we could bring that to the campus approach. So the OER lab was essentially built as a solution to meet the needs of our professors who, who do want to meet the, the increasing demand for OER, um, whether it's by administration or by students, but a way to support them 
um, in a sustainable way that also brings a lot of um, rich experiential learning to our students. So the OER lab um, is a student editorial team that um, works on resources brought to them by their clients who are the faculty members. They are managed by myself and uh, my colleague Susan Forbes, uh, who is the manager of the Teaching and Learning Center at Ontario Tech University. And the team uh, is responsible for basically fulfilling the roles that a typical editorial team would at, <clears throat> pardon me, at a uh, traditional publishing house. So they um, source material, they edit for consistency and clarity, they meet with their subject matter experts on a bi-weekly basis or more often as the, um, as the project requires. And this all really led to, um, you know, we were, we were looking at a cohesive campus approach by providing a one-stop shop for access to OER and support for OER. But what actually happened is we ended up getting OER uh, put in our strategic learning reimagined plan for the university. So we're now really seeing some um, administrative support and leadership support for OER on campus because we're, I think, looking at sort of novel solutions to what can be uh, thought of as the potential for unsustainability um, in OER. So what our lab provides, as I mentioned earlier, is, is really a cohesive approach. And if you're considering implementing something like this um, on campus, I think there really is a role for each and every type of student um, in, in this work. So we um, fulfill typical publishing uh, support roles, so development of a publishing plan if someone is looking to write from scratch, curriculum alignment, so finding resources that already exist in the, uh, the open networks that align with the given syllabi for a course, uh, creating figures and tables. So um, one of the things recognized by our faculty members is a lot of OER uh, that are sourced out of the United States have very US centric uh, data. So looking for data that's openly available, formatting it in uh, figures or tables for students to work with during examples, that kind of thing. Um, style formatting, sourcing of images. So there's so many open source uh, image sites. So looking for those that, that fit the book and providing that sort of um, graphic design support. Question writing and answer checking. Um, we can talk a little bit later if, if folks have questions about um, sort of how you can get students involved outside of a lab style, uh, style approach to creating questions and, and generating answers for uh, a given course, fact checking and research and multimedia creation. And um, our students are gonna talk a little bit about the multimedia creation later on in the discussion. Um, but I, I think the, um, the types of, of roles that we have, oh, there is Eamon. He's just signed on. Hello. Hi. Um, as, I, as I was saying before, what we really looked to do was provide that experiential, the true experiential learning for students. Um, so often I think that the, um, the roles that students are given on campus don't really harness their abilities and their creativity and their innovation um, to the extent that they, they might be required to demonstrate after graduation. So our goal was to sort of give them the the general outline of what where we wanted to go with the projects and you'll see um, on my next slide that they really really took off into some interesting um, directions with so much support from our faculty that we um, are going to be running the lab um, for this year constantly so rather than it just being a summer program so this link um, goes to our student created website so um, the students had lots of opportunity to explore sort of the, the um, public facing, if you will, side of things um, from the OER, OER lab. And again, that was, that was done intentionally to, to really um, free up their creativity and give them room to, to really work um, in, the, in the domains they were most interested in. So I'm going to uh, jump to our site. Um, it is, I will provide the slides uh, through Lillian for anyone who's interested in learning it. Lena has also linked to it in the chat. Thank you, Lena. So you can see um, the projects that we were 
we're working on this summer. So again, we only had three students in our lab um, due to some of the, the post-secondary budget constraints um, that we encountered in 2019 and in 2020. Um, this was significantly reduced from what we had hoped to provide, but you can see that we've got um, five projects that we were able to see into completion for um, for this summer alone, and that was on a reduced um, hourly workload as well. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a, in a little bit, but I wanted to demonstrate some of the projects that we've put together. So one of the things that really took off for us was um, working with um, H5P and the integration into Pressbooks to build um, interactive diagrams for anatomy and physiology classes. So this is another fairly large um, intensive class that uh, if anyone's ever taken anatomy and physiology is super diagram driven. So one of the big uh, drawbacks to a lot of science course OERs is the lack of, of images or the lack of what are deemed appropriate images to teach the course content. So we've actually um, created a suite of interactive um, question sets through H5P. This is an example. This is not the full library, which we're still working to get online um, and open access. But it allows students to, um, to really test their knowledge of you know, the topics without having to resort to some of the subscription-based traditional publishing um, models that are out there. And it also, um, you know, it gives the professor the flexibility as well. So we've, uh, we built it to her uh, exact specifications without, again, having to sort of say, okay, skip, skip diagram 2.5 because we don't really cover that in this course. It really allows us to customize um, the student experience. This is going to be embedded not only within the OER that they're using for the course, but also within our learning management system, which is Canvas, um, embedded directly in there so students are able to test themselves. And hopefully we'll see some outcomes in terms of student achievement. Um, it is a research project that the faculty member is undertaking uh, with regards to this project. And again, this is just one of the things we managed to um, produce for our lab over the summer. Um, another one was a full textbook build for our Business Math 1 course. Again, another fairly large course with a fairly um, low success rate in the university as a whole. So we've actually created an entirely new book based on, I think, over a dozen resources that are openly available. And this really, um, the book that comes up, nope, and it shouldn't be Business Math. Thank you, Lisa. It is... Um, Management in the enterprise. So we are building a business math one as well. It is not currently online because I have to finish it for this week. Um, so this is management of the enterprise, which again is another huge course um, that our students are taking in their first year of the uh, Bachelor of Commerce program. And what we did is we originally were using a well-known traditional publisher's resource and the course was essentially built off that. Um, the professor who is now teaching the course decided that he wanted to move away not only from the, um, the traditional publisher's resource around which the course was built but also wanted to give it more of a technology-based um, flavor because that is the direction that that program really takes it in. So going from sort of that cookie cutter um, intro business course and creating something that is much more focused on information technology uh, and the, the roles that our students will play in that. So um, again, if anyone is interested in, in using that resource, it is available on the, um, the eCampus Open Library. And we also ask if anyone's interested in using our work that you send us an email just so we can keep track of it as well. Uh, Lisa says, I'd be interested in that. We are using a, an OER business math book that I'm not fond of. If you're still working on it, um, perhaps this could be a collaborative effort. And that would be um, amazing, uh, Lisa. And I will, would love to connect with you on that. So that course um, is a two semester course that we run. Um, and it sort of is going to be a work in progress because we, um, we had a number of hiccups dealing with uh, some of the accessibility features of the source material that uh, the students really, really had to, to dig in and find the solutions to. So um, that is something that it's, it's sort of a work in progress as we go. But that would be 
be great. And I know that business math is sort of an area of need um, Canada wide. Um, I sit on the uh, digital resources consortium that was started up um, sort of in the midst of the, the peak of the pandemic. And that has definitely been identified as an, an area of need. So um, the textbook build for business math is not online. So you can see my links are incorrect here. Um, what we also did was some of our and I would love to compare notes as well, and I might um, get us involved with the professor for the course and see what can be done about that as well. Um, it would be a, a super interesting project, I think. And, and of course, if, uh, if we're building sort of OER lab teams across the province or across the country, I think that gives us so much more room to build. So Lisa is asking about uh, the plan to build ancillary resources for the OER that we are creating, and yes, that is the plan. Um, so it, it was sort of the one of the initial offerings that we had planned to to do over the summer. But again, with our reduced staffing and our reduced work hours, uh, we weren't able to provide as many ancillaries as possible. Um, you can see the the H5P diagrams for anatomy and physiology are one of the ancillaries that we addressed. But in terms of building slide decks and things like that. Um, we're really, really lucky at Ontario Tech in that the professors are very willing to contribute to that. Um, and that is definitely something that they've asked for as well. Uh, for example, the AMP resource, we could blend the MT OER team together with your team. So Lisa, do you do, um, I don't know if you wanted to, to go on mute and, and I'm fine with kind of going in this direction too. Um, what role do you play at your institution, just so I have an idea? This is Kim. Oh, it's not Lisa. Hi, Kim. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, what I'll do is I'll leave my email for, for anyone who wants to, to discuss sort of the linking um, between resources. And I will talk about funding, so I can jump to that next and um, how we, we manage to deal with that. So um, as I mentioned, and for those of you who are in Ontario, you're probably very familiar with um, sort of the, the goings on sort of pre-pandemic and during pandemic. Uh, Kim, you stole Lisa's link. <laughs> so I'm just seeing that the chatting come up. Um, so again, as I, as I mentioned, if those of you saw my presentation um, at TEST 2019, um, when we were just launching the lab, we had actually planned to have a great deal more students um, working for us and we were going to seek some institutional funding um, because of certain budgetary uh, restrictions and, and then the COVID crisis. We did a pivot to actually use our institution's university works program to hire students. So um, this way we could keep the students in the program as, as designed, so um, making them eligible for, for whatever funding was necessary for them. But it really um, alleviated some of those financial pressures because we used an existing program. Um, I don't know how it works at every um, institution, but we put in bids every semester for uh, the number of positions that we want to hire for, and then it gets allotted on a priority basis. So our lab has been, um, allotted our three students for the remainder of 2020 and into 2021 until the summertime. And I anticipate sort of a growth of the lab uh, for summer 2021. So that is how we've sort of managed to deal with these uncertain times. Um, so I, rather than, I think some of the, the older models or the, the you know, previously used models, I don't want to say old models, is to give um, individual professors sort of an, a grant or an incentive package to hire students to create their OER. In my opinion, that doesn't really um, address the lack of sustainability and it doesn't do a lot to address the lack of resources because the onus is still on the professor to do the hiring, to manage the work, um, when really what we need is their expertise in the subject matter, and then the expertise in publishing can fall to us. Um, so really, we, we wanted to go away from that, um, that grant model, because it's, it's, 
a similar model to the traditional publishers where they distribute royalties for the work. Um, Ali is asking if we can speak to whether or not we've partnered with the library. Yes, so um, again, pre-COVID, we had actually planned quite a robust um, partnership with the library in terms of space and also of printing. So our plan was to have a um, on-demand print shop operated out of our library for OER produced by the lab. So if any student um, had an OER that they wanted a physical copy of, they could go to our library and we could um, work with it this way. So previously, um, Ontario Tech um, used a lot of services with our partner Durham College. Um, we're on the same campus for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with our situation. And a lot of our services were shared. Our bookstore and our print shop, um, previously it was things like IT, um, financial services, that kind of thing. So as the university and college have grown, they've adopted their own individual services. So in order to free up some of our print shop resources, we were planning to have a print um, on demand operated out of our library. And that was where our office was going to be located as well. So given all the changes, um, with COVID and with budgets, we were unable to do that, but we are working really closely with the library in terms of um, of leading sort of the direction of OER on campus. So we meet uh, monthly with our librarian staff um, to sort of see where we are. They contribute um, a great deal to the events that we hold on campus in OER recognition and advocacy, um, which I can mention as we come up, because that was um, what Rebecca was going to talk about, but she's in class today as well. Um, so we really have a lot of partnership with uh, the library. We're working on ways to make it more broadly known to students that OER are available in their courses. We've taken a, um, a page from Kwantlen Polytechnic's um, playbook in terms of posting whether or not a course uses OER or affordable course content directly in the registration system so students are actually able to filter their classes by the attributes of OER or affordable course content and that gives students a greater voice in terms of advocating for OER. So I want to talk a little bit about the you know enough of my perspective but I want to talk a little bit to the students perspective as well. So I have um, three students who worked with me over the summer in the OER lab, uh, Rebecca, Pranjal, and Eamon. And I've got to say, I, I don't work often with students. Um, I'm a faculty development officer, so faculty are my primary interactions on campus. But I was so privileged to work with these three over the summer. Uh, we're working together for all of this academic year as well. And we're going to start branching out um, a little bit to some more advocacy work as well as the traditional publishing work that, that the lab is going to, to do. Oh, Catherine Davidson uh, mentioned that we had both Rajiv Jangani um, hosted at the Ontario Tech and Durham College Library. Um, so that, that was really what kind of spurred, spurred our efforts was Rajiv's visit, uh, and it was sponsored by our library um, on campus. So um, we've been putting on some advocacy pieces um, haphazardly over the last few years. We had our first um, OER day last November 1st. Um, we're planning to do so again this year. And really what I wanna see this year is the drive by the students and, and the student voice given to the presentations. Um, so the, the three students who work in the lab are um, looking to work with the student union, uh, with their faculty association, um, their student faculty societies, um, with the library system to really create a robust advocacy network to, to really showcase what OER can do for students. Um, we're participating in, in webinars like these, but I'm also um, hoping that the students provide training in press books because as they may tell you, uh, we learned a lot about press books over the summer and what it, the, it's idiosyncrasies, I will say. Um, so, so that's really what we're hoping to branch out into um, to, to give the students again that, that experiential learning. And I'm gonna call on Pranjal to speak now. Um, she is one of our students to talk about sort of her experiences working with faculty um, and the sort of that whole experiential learning piece. 
Hey everyone. Um, well, I'll start off by introducing myself. Um, so I am a fourth year um, software engineering and management student at um, Ontario Tech and I am currently um, also working for the OER lab as a content developer. So um, I, in the session I'll be talking a little bit about um, faculty invol um, involvement and, um, and feedbacks, um, student and faculty involvement and feedbacks. Um, so um, some ways we can get student perspectives or faculty uh, perspectives on um, OER lab is through advocacy, um, experimental learning, uh, knowledge building. And what I mean by um, these points um, is that, um, uh, for example, we can, um, we can start off by uh, promoting OER lab within our, um, uh, within our school and our students and faculties through various different platforms. For example, social media promoting what we do um, and kind of letting the word out there uh, for the students and faculty members. That's one way we can do it. We can have uh, booths where we, um, uh, uh, booths throughout the school where we kind of introduce again what OER is, how it's beneficial for uh, students and faculty members, especially during the COVID times. Um, uh, again, as, as Sarah mentioned, we can uh, get involved with student union, um, library workshops, um, different faculties. For example, if I'm under Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science, so I can take care of that, that faculty and um, other students from uh, uh, what I mean is that Rebecca and Eamon can take um, care of other faculties. So kind of getting um, faculty members and faculties and students involved um, in OER Lab. Um, we can... Uh, we can uh, through um, previous exp uh, experiences that we have had with um, uh, working on different projects. We can um, kind of learn um, and get that knowledge building on how to improve on our um, on our next projects uh, by getting feedbacks from again uh, faculty members and um, the professors that we were working for for uh, getting feedbacks from students. Um, kind of seeing what are the pieces that they liked and what the, what are the pieces that they didn't like so we can kind of work um, on different projects um, and kind of improve on it. Um, um, yeah and I mean those are uh, some ways we can do surveys again um, to kind of uh, um, get an idea of what are the things that we're doing right and what are the things that we're not doing right so th there's a lot of ways we can um, get faculty and uh, students um, involved and these are some of the points that I I think it, it was important that um, I outlined. And yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Pranjal. Um, Amen. if you want to um, sort of give your perspective too, I'm sure the, the audience would love to hear it. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ayman. I'm a third year mechatronics engineering student at uh, Ontario Tech University. Um, and I'm a content developer at the OER lab. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, one of my responsibilities at the OER lab. Um, so uh, my responsibility is, uh, includes um, researching opportunities uh, that will leverage OER lab experience and expertise in new ways. Um, one of the things that we are looking to implement in the future is um, developing uh, open textbooks along with online homework with instant feedback. A potential software that we are looking into using is uh, MyOpenMath. Uh, MyOpenMath is a free open source uh, online course ma management system for math and other quantitative subjects. Um, uh, my, my open math also supports content delivery on a limited basis. My open math uh, runs on the open source uh, IMATS AS uh, platform. IMATS AS was developed by a professor at Pierce College. Um, his name is David Lipman. Uh, it started in 2011, and since then, uh, many textbooks, along with online homeworks, have been built uh, on my open math. Um, uh, and it is also user friendly. It can be integrated into Canvas as well as Blackboard. Um, and beyond that, my open maths uh, includes learning management tools, uh, uh, such as uh, including uh, announcements, uh, uh, posting like uh, videos and attachments, as well as dis discussion forums and a full gatebook. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna give a quick demo of uh, how my open maths uh, like looks like. 
Oh, I'm just I'm just gonna share my screen. Uh, so here's how uh, my open maths, uh, here's what it looks like. And um, I'm just going to show you, um, I'm going to go to pre-calculus one and then go to uh, chapter one. Uh, and as you can see, like my, my open maths uh, has uh, like open uh, open uh, books. Uh, like it's like a self, uh, self study, self study book for pre-algebra. So if a student wants to learn about the pre-algebra, they can just go here and go over the lectures. And then if they want to uh, do some review problems, they can go to the review problems. And I'm gonna show you a few questions. Uh, I'm gonna choose question eight. Um, the reason I chose question eight is because uh, I just wanna show you how accurate um, uh, my open maths is. So this question is asking like for the domain of, uh, domain of this uh, graph. Uh, so the domain of this graph is, it's gonna be from negative three to one. Uh, and I just wanna point out that in maths, a square bracket means that it includes the number, whereas a round bracket means that uh, it, it doesn't include that number. And, and the range here is gonna be from negative five to four. Uh, and I'm just gonna submit it. Uh, right here, I think I made a mistake somewhere. Yeah, I, I just wanted to point out uh, that like, uh, it's, a, it's very picky, my, my maths. If you make a round bracket instead of a, a square bracket, it's gonna mark it as a, as a mistake. I'm just gonna go to question 10. Uh, this is a typical pre-algebra question. It's uh, uh, graphing uh, discontinuous functions. Uh, so uh, my open maths also allows you to uh, plot graphs. And uh, the thing I like about my open maths is that it gives you like instant feedback. It's gonna tell you whether your graph is right or wrong. So you can just, pl you can plot like uh, lines as well as dots. Uh, this is gonna be something like. And an open dot. And you can check it if it is right or wrong. And yeah, that's it. Yeah, thank you for listening. Thanks, Simon. Um, I'm gonna share my screen again. So I just wanted to point out some of the, the things that uh, Ayman showed us is that's where that sort of perceived quality um, issue can sometimes come up. And, and some of our folks in the, the chat had mentioned the lack of ancillary resources or the lack of those support systems that you typically see with traditional publishers. They're out there and they're open. It's just, again, we lack a lot of the resources to to fully understand the programs that are out there or explore them. Um, and that's really what the students have been doing a lot of this summer. Um, you know, we, we got really, really familiar with, with LaTeX um, implementation in Pressbooks because we wanna make sure that our books are accessible right from the get-go. And again, that's something that professors don't see in the background of, of a traditional publisher. So something that we can give them as a value add being able to integrate something like my open math into our business math textbook as sort of a, a next step um, to again decrease that reliance on those subscription-based um, instant feedback systems and and work on ones that are really tailored specifically to what the students are learning so you know if they're not working on sort of piecewise functions those can be eliminated entirely rather than students having to sort of skip through them or or encounter them and not really be sure this is giving them a completely tailored approach. So that's really um, some of the, the interesting and creative work that the OER lab has done. And this is just, again, it's an overview. It really doesn't 
an hour doesn't give me enough time to explain all the interesting things that we've done uh, over the summer. And uh, if you're interested in learning more, I'd be more than happy to discuss with anyone. Um, I just wanted to sort of end off with some of the faculty feedback from, from the resources. Um, overwhelmingly, this, the, the faculty have been enthusiastic, not only because of the end product, but also of the process. So dealing with students, um, you know, they get a lot of personalized attention from the lab. So we do um, individual one-on-one -on -one meetings where we discuss, you know, what you liked and what you didn't like, which you're not going to have uh, happen with a traditional publishers because it is not customizable. So, you know, the students um, and the faculty, there was a lot of uh, really rich experiential learning that the students gained in terms of um, working with a client, setting up meetings, um, sort of moderating meetings, gaining feedback, addressing feedback in ways that um, worked for all parties involved. So I think to the the learning that comes out of participating in the lab, not just the, the end content, is really something that we're seeing um, so much benefit from. And I'm really excited to see uh, move on in the future. So that is really it for our presentation. Um, I neglected to put my email on the screen, so um, I can provide it for you in the chat if you want to get in touch with me or with the lab. Um, and if there are any questions, we'd be more than happy to take them. So you can see my emails are in the chat. It's sarah.stokes at Ontario Tech U. Make sure you put the U or it will not reach me. Um, or OER at Ontario Tech U .ca. So um, I guess I'll wait for any questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Well, thank you so Great. much. Um, Sarah and Eamon and Pranjal, I really appreciated hearing about this and it was super informative. Um, and a reminder folks that you can just drop a question in the chat or if you have a question you wanna come on mic for, you can feel free to um, raise, uh, raise your hand um, and I will uh, unmute you. Oh, I've got a barker in my <laughs> background. Um, Sarah, I really uh, appreciated learning about the uh, about the OER lab and hearing about the the student experience. I was wondering if the if you would be able to share um, now that you've gone through one round of this, um, you know, one one thing that you you learned that you um, would improve on for next time if you were going to start all over. Oh boy, um, COVID COVID accepted. <laughs> oh really? I can't I can't change global circumstances, eh? Um, so in terms of what we would change, um, it would probably be, I guess, having a clearer idea of the source material we were working with. And this goes to also Jane's question in the chat about accessibility. So we were dealing with some source material that was formatted in Word um, and had basically no accessibility standards whatsoever and combining it with a text that was accessible. So um, we didn't know of a lot of the tr roadblocks we would run into when working with such, you know, dichotomous uh, resources. Um, you know, so we'd have some chapters that uploaded perfectly, some chapters that wouldn't upload at all, um, some that needed a complete manual overhaul. So a lot of these learnings, um, we know now and we know for next time and we can, I think, choose a bit more carefully what, what we're doing. Um, other than, than that, if I could, you know, wave my magic wand and get a bigger budget, that would be great. Um, and we had three students employed by the lab and we also had some students who took part um, intermittently with uh, their capstone project. So that could be another way that um, you can get a lab funded is if you have sort of capstone or, or project-based sort of fourth year classes that are looking for um, employment, again, especially due to COVID, um, it might be a way to, to get those students employed in something that is similar to what they would be doing at an internship or a co-op. Um, but again, it, it gets you that human resource that you need for a lab, and it also gets them that kind of the check for their, their course. Um, 
So Jane, um, in terms of accessibility standards, we are just uh, following sort of our standard WCAG um, compliance. The, the biggest issue we've had is making our, um, our math compliant. So a lot of the OER that are out there use images um, that aren't, that don't have sort of math speak tied into the alt text. So we've been working with like a complement of, um, we use math type uh, to generate the accessible math code and then we input it into um, Pressbooks with WP Late, Quick LaTeX enabled and then we're able to get uh, screen reader friendly math coming out of our e-textbooks. Um, Ali is may, maybe picking my brain and again please do. Um, I think the more we can collaborate the better whether it's um, collaborating on specific projects. I know we have a lot of faculty members who are in need of finding that collaborator to help them sort of generate the book that they're looking for, um, but also in terms of, um, of working together with student labs um, across campuses, I think we could see some really interesting um, sort of benefit come out of the, the group learning. Great, and if there are any other questions for Sarah or for any, are there the students that are, are here? Um, again, I'm always so grateful to have students um, on these calls and to hear the student perspective about um, participating in, in this work. So if you have any other questions for anyone, feel free to drop them in the chat now and we'll take a few seconds of silence to see if anything uh, comes in. Okay, well, seeing no um, questions come in, I really look forward to hearing more and more about how this work continues um, to evolve, to, to hearing about those uh, resources that you've created or are almost done creating, um, being put in, into, into use. Um, and um, we're, again, incredibly grateful and appreciative of, you, of your time um, and, and your, your participation today. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen one last time uh, to a little plug for our next month's um, webinar. As a reminder, we do these every month um, on the second Tuesday of the month at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Um, they're open to anyone. Um, and you might have heard uh, Sarah talk a little bit about sort of considering uh, grant funding versus um, considering uh, this kind of a model for support. Uh, so Next month, we are going to do a spotlight on some of the campus grant programs, um, how to support and we are working on your campus. Please join us on October 13th. Um, you can always find the, our next webinar registration on the Open Library website. Um, if you click on the Get Support button at the top, uh, you'll be able to find that. Um, again, we are so, so appreciative of Sarah, of uh, your students, um, and in general of having such amazing educators in Ontario. Um, doing such interesting work and supporting people finding more flexible and affordable, uh, more flexible and affordable course materials. Um, so uh, I thank you again so much. <laughs>